Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org, and this is theCUBE, Silicon Angles, continuous production. We're here at Knowledge, and as you know, we're also broadcasting live from Sapphire now down in Orlando. We're also at Google I.O. The, the tweet stream is just being inundated with Google I.O. traffic, so we're trying to get some words, words in edgewise with a no13 hashtag. You can tweet me, I'm, I'm at D Vellante. And we're here, we're doing wall-to-wall -wall coverage, myself and Jeff Frick. Uh, of course, John Furrier's down at Sapphire. And we're here with, with practitioners from Yale University. Dorothy Artali is focused on the knowledge side of the operation, and Ricardo Chavera is the IT director at Yale University. I feel smarter just being hanging out <laughs> with you guys. So, uh, of course, I'm from Harvard, Mass. So uh, oh. there you go. We, uh, and we're right near Princeton, so we've got the whole Ivy League covered here. But um, okay. so anyway, thanks for taking some time out, and and welcome to the Cube. Thank you for thanks. having us. Glad to be here. So this is a great conference. We we've been all morning and and into the afternoon, sort of <coughs> digging into uh, how practitioners are using service now. We come to a lot of events and we love to sort of test uh, what the vendor says matches with what the customer base says. Sure. And I have to say the alignment is, is very high. But um, so Ricardo, why don't we start with you sure. uh, in just in terms of your role at, at Yale, your IT director, so you've got a, a broad scope. <coughs> what, what, do you, what do you do there? So I'm part of the service management team. And we are primarily charged with setting up and running our search manager, ma service management program, which includes all of our uh, idle processes. We're currently running incident management, problem change, release, knowledge management. Uh, so it's, it's a combination of looking at the uh, uh, and implementing and improving the processes, but also how that's implemented and uh, acted upon with the tool, and our tool choice is ServiceNow. So it's both at the tool level and at the process level, and we also have a uh, uh, charge with working on governance issues for uh, the entire IT organization. Okay, and Dorothy, obviously a lot of knowledge at, at Yale, so what is your, your role as kind of the, the knowledge management person? So um, it's very, knowledge is very important to Yale, and there's a lot, of diver, uh, a lot of groups within the IT organization that have their own repositories of knowledge. And we're trying to um, get it all into uh, one knowledge base so that everybody can share everybody else's knowledge. So we can provide rock solid services for our clients. So when they call our help desk, our help desk can accommodate them or help them with their problems or just give them information and to build our, the confidence in our clients and um, to get the same information from day to day, which is important, and to not rediscover knowledge. Hmm. Um, just because it's in my head doesn't mean it's in your head. So um, it's very important. We want to um, increase e efficiency without rediscovering information. And it's, very, it's just a very important practice at Yale. Knowledge management is fairly new. The position's only been open a year. I've been in it since the beginning of August. We, we've done a lot with knowledge and we look forward to doing a lot more and using ServiceNow as a tool currently. So tell me, so knowledge, is, is knowledge the kind of thing you know it when you see it or do you guys rigorously define knowledge? What is knowledge? Knowledge is how to do something. How to pr uh, We have service providers that provide how to um, back up a computer or email. And um, so we consider the, the owners of the service uh, subject matter experts. And we need them to write information about their subject so our tier one support can help our clients and have the most accurate information to help our clients. So how do you, uh, do you proactively try to go out and get people to create this knowledge? Are you trying to capture existing knowledge? Is it a bit of both? So it's, it is a bit of both, and we're starting to require when we roll out a new service that knowledge needs to be there. Not the day after this new service <laughs> is rolled out, but weeks before so we can educate the um, tier one support that are helping the clients. I think Rick Smith said yesterday um, in his talk that um, that client confidence, um, you know, our first impressions for our clients is our tier one support. And if our tier one support knows how to help them, it's going to boost the confidence for our clients. And that's very important to us. So Ricardo, yeah. the yes. impetus for bringing in ServiceNow was the, was it the, the ServiceNow classic incident, you know, problem change management, is that right? Yes, yeah, so we, we, we 
knew that we wanted a, basically a, a more formalized process management uh, and process improvement pr program. Uh, Idle is sort of the, uh, considered the, the de facto standard for how to run an IT shop, and we adopted it as our operating model. And we also, but once we have that process in place, we still need a tool in order to implement it, to act on it, and give us something, a uh, concrete way of managing our work. And ServiceNow is very well aligned with the, stand the best practices that Idle lays out. You say, oh, yeah, yeah, right, I, I tell, I thought you said yes. Idle. Okay, yes. got it. So I was thinking autonomy there for a second, but not me. <laughs> ITIL. Yes. Okay, and so you start with the, the as I say, the classic change problem, uh, uh, incident management. Yep. And then Dorothy, how did ServiceNow come into your domain? Did you write an app? Uh, did it sort of, was it so, the natural outgrowth of? So it was, um, it was a new position that Yale um, created. They felt they needed a dedicated knowledge manager. I came from a long technical background and took the job, um, at, applied for the job as a knowledge manager and, and um, accepted the job. And it's, it's just been a really fun year um, working with people and seeing how much knowledge we have out there and to build the knowledge base. Um, and working with all the different groups and making them realize the value of knowledge that it is important to get it out of our heads and onto paper. So how did you start using <coughs> ServiceNow? How did I start using yeah, ServiceNow? I was, a, I was a client at first, so I hmm. used change management incident right. problem, and then when I got the job, they had already had the knowledge base set up. They just didn't have a dedicated person at the time to work okay, on knowledge. Okay, so, so, so how does that work? Is there a, a, an app or a module inside of ServiceNow? There's now? a, okay. sorry, there's a module yeah. inside of ServiceNow. Okay. And it was already set up. So that's so out of the box. So there's a knowledge base, okay. yes. And, and now what kind of customization did you have to do, if any? So it's still, we're still today using it pretty much out of the box, and I have written um, some Visio diagrams on workflow, and we are going to start automating that process mm -hmm. within the next few months and to I, streamline it a little. Now I know Rick Smith is coming in uh, uh, shortly, but right. sorry, before we get off the knowledge piece, I, I really want to understand sort of how you would recommend folks that are trying to tackle similar problems, how would you recommend that they go about um, you know, initiating this type of, of project and, and what kinds of things would you recommend, what would you not do if you had to do it over again, those types of things. Well, I think it's important be, um, to have your dedicated knowledge manager prying to, roll, to rolling out knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest things that we did was create a subject matter experts list and we went to each service owner and found out who their experts were. And from their experts, we created authors and editors. An author can draft an article, and an editor would uh, check the article for its quality, for its content, for its grammatical and um, spelling. You have all little things that you need to check there. And um, that helps build the foundation and get the quality information in there. Then you have to go out and campaign. And, and to get say, adoption of it. To get yeah, adoption exactly. of it. And it's what it, what's in it for me? Well, for the service owner, you're going to get better exposure. When we create a knowledge article, we are going to populate certain fields in an incident for you, which is going to give you better metrics at the end of the day for your reporting. For um, the help, one, help um, tier one support, it is going to help them have confidence when they're on the phone with the client. It's going to help them answer the call and not have to escalate the call to somebody. For our clients, it's going to—it's not only going to answer the question for them, but they're going to see the value and the and the have the confidence in IT. And then for leadership, they're just going to see all the benefits about running a more efficient IT organization, and um, notice that we're closing calls faster, our clients are happier. What's so. the user experience like? I mean, I'm 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 imagining you know if I can't figure something out, I do what everybody else does, I Google it. Right. Uh, you know, so is that a similar user experience with Inside Service now? So um, today at Yale, we actually have a feed from ServiceNow to our website, and we have a section called How To Articles, and those are knowledge base mm -hmm. articles, but our clients don't see them as knowledge base articles. They see them as nice little pretty web pages, and it shows them how to configure their email or, um, you know, a problem, possibly a problem with a backup. Um, certain things that they would be able to handle themselves, but not the technical documentation that would stay in service now for our IT um, employees. Okay, so so you guys publish those how-tos, right. goes mm -hmm. up on your website, they search it like they would search anything, right? and, and then the, 
the actual creation of the content, where does that occur? That occurs outside of service now? No, that, uh, that, uh, that's, uh, that's inside service. In now. service now, okay, yes. Okay, so, so, so it's essentially, a publish, you use it as a publishing platform and a right. content management system. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just learning about all these yeah. other things <laughs> ServiceNow can do. Okay, yep. this is good drill down. So okay. that was a customization that we did at Yale <laughs> with the feed from ServiceNow into our, our web uh, tool is Drupal. So we feed the information into Drupal onto our website, and it looks all it looks it makes everything skin the same right. on the website. Okay, so Drupal is your 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 content Retool. management system essentially at the back for end. the web. Yeah, the, yes. the presentation layer for the yes. website. So, okay, great and, and uh, fascinating. Okay, uh, uh, Dorothy, last word, and then we're gonna we're gonna switch you out, bring uh, Rick in, talk about metrics. But, okay. Uh, any final thoughts on uh, on knowledge for your peers, or you know, just um, closing thoughts. So knowledge, just make sure that you, um, it, is, it is a process, it's not a tool. Um, the tool is service now, knowledge is a process, you want to incorporate it, incorporate it in change, incident, problem, in the other processes, it, it supports the other processes. It's very important. It's a change in culture, getting um, the other processes as people are using um, opening an incident to check knowledge, to find the information there so they can close the ticket faster, so they can help the client. And I think that's the most important takeaway, to change the culture so they're not thinking of it as a tool, but cool. as a process. Dorothy, well, thank you very much for thank sharing that, that insight. Okay, Dorothy's going to swap out now. Me. with, uh, And we'll in, in a moment introduce Rick Smith. But Ricardo, I want to come back yes. to you and talk a little bit about um, how ServiceNow is being used, you know, today, we, we talked about that, but how you see it being used in the future. So, is this something that you see, you know, continuing to expand in terms of new applications? We saw App Creator right. you know, announced yesterday. Are you guys, do you envision taking advantage of that? I wonder if we could talk about that a little bit. Sure, I mean, we, we got into this process and, and came to ServiceNow looking primarily for a service management platform. And we need something to do ITSM, and it, do, and it does that well and is extremely versatile and flexible with, in that regard. Uh, so we're continuing to build that out, and we have some of the core processes in place. We're going to be moving, we're working on a CMDB now, a configuration management database, uh, looking at release manage, a lot of other processes in order to continue to mature the program. Uh, there's also a lot of possibilities because we have the, the ability to, as you say, create, create new apps. The app, app creator is giving us a lot more flexibility. Uh, there are areas where we can actually tie in better with some of our functional partners, non-IT departments, not, not necessarily to do non-IT functions, but to more fully leverage the uh, interactions that we have with other, not, other, uh, other departments on campus. So what was life like before you brought in ServiceNow? Can you paint a picture for us? So it was, uh, a lot, there were a lot of ad hoc and inconsistent processes. So uh, there were some areas that were where we were sort of trying to uh, practice good process management, and some so some areas where we were consistent. Other parts of the organization weren't doing it. So there was not a consistency consistency in process from end to end. There also wasn't isn't real consistency in what I would call service ownership. So the discussion of when when a, when an issue happens or something breaks, uh, who owns it? And we, oftentimes we we're, were very IT focus and saying, well, this widget is broken and that belongs to them, so it's not my issue, or it's not my area, it's someone else's area. A lot of finger pointing. Lot, uh, you, the finger pointing or just sort of checking within your own silo, very structured, very siloed. Uh, or hot, potato, hot potatoing, yeah, that, it's that, not my that, problem. That, that too, yeah, right. Okay. You know, checking if it's your system, if, you're, if it's not your system, then you're done. But now, we have this notion of ownership of, a, of, a, of an actual service, not necessarily an application or a uh, a technical widget, but an overall service, and there are a lot of technical components that go into making that service available. For email, for example, it isn't just the email server that you have to check if you're the, if you're the owner of, ser of, that e of that service. You also have to care about the network, you also have to care about support, the en endpoint device, like your, your laptop or your phone. All of those things need to be in, in place in order for people to use your service. And so you have that accountability as a service owner for that end to end. And we've been developing and uh, maturing this concept uh, hand in hand with our process improvement and with uh, use of the tool at ServiceNow. And it sounds like you're in the process of building out your CMDB, is that correct? That's right. Okay, so you so how's that work? You sort of, you bring in pieces one at a time, you tear down the old ones. Talk about how you get rid of stuff. So, uh, 
decommissioning things is something which doesn't happen often enough. Uh, I think there's a small party, a small uh, people get really excited when we finally do turn off an old an old server or, dis or decommission an old application. Uh, all too often we launch something new and it runs side by side with the old legacy systems, and decommission the old stuff isn't. Uh, it isn't always part of the project plan for, for launching something new. Uh, what we're doing now with the, with, the con, with the CMDB is defining what our CIs are, what our configuration items are. For example, we now have a uh, canonical list of all the applications that we own and run in, in our organization. It's extremely long and complicated, but we've, we've, we've settled on it, and it's, of course it's going to be an organic thing and change, but it lives in our CMDB, and, and we can now uh, soon when we, when we release this in, into our service now instance, we'll be able to point to and say it's this application for which there's an issue or this application we're going to make a change to and it will all be looking at the same list, same data. Uh, and that's going to be a great step forward. Okay, Rick Smith has joined us. He is the Director of Metrics and Quality Assurance at Yale University. Uh, Rick, welcome, thanks for coming on. Hey. My pleasure. So metrics is obviously uh, a hot topic, uh, particularly when you're implementing a system like this. Uh, Talk about your role, what scope do you have, and then we'll get into the met metrics discussion. Sure. Oh, my primary responsibility is to ensure quality throughout the ITS uh, systems and services that we provide. Uh, it's also to kind of direct us toward uh, being client focused and that we make fact-based decisions whenever possible mm -hmm. as opposed to making uh, decisions based on anecdotal information. Yeah, okay, so mm -hmm. you, you come into this role, uh, you obviously don't have a blank piece of paper. Every organization has metrics, you know? Some yeah. organizations have too many metrics. So, sure. so what was the situation like um, when you came in to this role? And, and if you can, talk about pre-service now and post-service now. I think as I, I came into the role, Yale was uh, much like uh, many other organizations where there was a uh, plethora of data, mm. but little information. People were inundated with hundreds and thousands of reports, but those reports weren't um, synthesized to give them actionable information, things that they could take action on to improve. And I guess in, in that same vein, looking at where we were and where we are now, through the use of ServiceNow, it allowed us to categorize that data, synthesize information from it, and generate scorecards and dashboards that were much more actionable and allowed our managers to better perform their services and improve service to our clients. Did that categorization, did you have to do that manually? How did that all come about? Or did, are, there, are there facilities to help you sort of automate that classification? Well, the classification and, and one of the rules or principles that we use is to go with the critical few versus the useful many. <laughs> and what we saw is there are a lot of things that we can measure, but not everything that can be should be. There has to be a return on that investment. The things that we measure have to be those things that give us the greatest benefit and add the greatest value. The other thing that uh, our kind of principle that we employed is we found out there are five things really that a client is really interested in and contributes to satisfaction. And we kind of define that in a mnemonic that we call FACE, F-A-C-E. And so the key metrics were fast, accurate, uh, cost efficient and easy. And what we found is if you at least had two to three metrics in that fast, accurate, cost effective and easy, you were pretty much on target to meeting your client satisfaction needs and world class service. Okay, so so that's good advice, boil it down to it. Don't boil the ocean. Exactly. Just, just take a few Start metrics simple. that yeah. matter that are actually going to drive your organization or your business if you're a yeah. commercial entity. Um, so how do people how do you use those metrics? How do people get access to them? How does it affect change? Um, how they access it, as part of a ServiceNow, uh, we were able to configure some standard reports or global reports that were developed for our managers that made it easy for them to access information that they, that they needed. Uh, one of the insights that doesn't seem like it should be that great of an insight, but we looked at the name and it's ServiceNow, N-O-W. And really that was the real advantage that we found with ServiceNow, is it provided immediate feedback in terms of how the service or process was performing right now. Our challenge then, once we knew how it's performing now, is that we also then had to see how were we performing in the past and how did we hope to perform in the future. 
and the triangulation of those three are the things that uh, guide our managers in providing yeah. service, yeah. good service. Okay, so the key is get the right metrics. So you get you, you get to the point you get the right metrics, then you got to put them in the right people's hands. Exactly. You know the old maxim: if you can't if you can't manage it or you can't, can't measure it, you can't manage it. Right. So then, how does it affect ongoing improvement? Um, presumably, right. you're doing this to to get better. Excellent. So can you talk about that a little bit uh, in terms of? how you guys have improved and maybe the role that ServiceNow has played there. Um, well, one of the uh, examples, and in fact in the presentation that I gave yesterday, we used a chart that showed that prior to ServiceNow, when we were looking at our incident uh, management system, the call abandonment rate, was the number of calls that were coming in and those that were being abandoned, were somewhere north of 25%. Not a very good performance. <laughs> The issue was that our managers really couldn't, didn't have transparency into that number. And, and this was again a great insight for us and it just shows that it doesn't have to be complex or onerous. But if your metrics or your performance are transparent and you provide that information to the managers in real time, action will occur. In fact, where we saw the abandonment rate at 25%, once we got the metrics in and started providing those reports to the managers, we saw it drop in less than, I think it was about three weeks, yeah. to less than three to four percent of calls were abandoned. That's a tremendous improvement. Right. And the only action that we had put in place at that time was simply providing transparency and immediacy of information to the managers. How are you guys providing service to your end users? Is it, you've, you've said calls a couple of times. Is that the main touch point? Is pick up the phone, the email, chat? I mean, how, how do you interact with them? What so, are the channels? So we have various channels for, for tier one support, like the primary, when something breaks, I need help with it. The biggest uh, and most immediate way to get help is, uh, is, is by phone. We have a help desk that's open uh, all, all day long. Uh, agents are standing by at all times. Uh, but we also do, take, do intake by email. Uh, there are also field reps who uh, do uh, house calls, basically uh, technicians who do uh, field out, out in the field, go to the people's desk site visits. Uh, some things that just can't be fixed remotely, but uh, a lot can. And when they, it does need actual personal visit, we have technicians who go out in the, in the field. Uh, we're looking into opening up, up other channels, uh, exploring chat options as well, uh, other, other things like that. The, um, the metrics that you're tracking and the, the initiative is primarily focused on IT, right? right? Do you envision pointing that at the business at some point in time, and, and, and if so, how are they going to feel about you tracking metrics about, you know, the, I actually say business, obviously it's, it's a university, sure. but you know, sure. I mean, the mm -hmm. sort of organization. Right. Um, well, I, I think the, uh, there is a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of synergies to be had between our, ourselves and a lot of functional partners. So we, ha we work very closely with people in HR, in finance, in procurement, uh, and, and those are traditional business, business uh, organizations. They just do the business of uh, HR, finance, for, for a major university. Right. And they have, uh, they have their own call, some of them have their own call centers, they have their own service metrics. Uh, and I think what we're finding is that there's uh, a lot of commonality in what we're tracking, uh, things we're trying to do, and things that they're trying to do. So I, I, would, I would envision in the future a lot of, uh, lot, lot of sharing, cross-pollination of the kind of metrics that we're reporting on, kind of process improvement programs. At kind of a higher level, what's sort of driving your organization? What's changing in your quote unquote business? I mean, you're Yale, right? I mean, you got this great reputation, but co you know, college is so competitive these days. Um, what's driving what's driving your, your business? What's what's driving you to change? Sure. Well, I think uh, for, for IT, our, 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 our main mission is to advance the mission of the university. We don't exist just for the sake of IT. We're not an IT shop that develops application of the research. We, we live uh, and breathe to advance the mission of Yale University, which is to, um, uh, it, it's all about the uh, creation, preservation, and dissemination of knowledge. So uh, next week, Yale will be celebrating our 312th commencement. So we've been around for a long time, a great tradition, but there's also a constant need for uh, innovation, for developing new products, uh, new, new services uh, to, to advance the university. So we have faculty members doing, uh, providing great courses. We have researchers doing cutting edge research in all the sciences and medical areas. And all the work that they do, whether it's in a classroom, whether it's in a lab, whether it's uh, in any environment, uh, requires IT. And so, uh, if we want Yale to be th the best that it can be, we need to provide the best services for all those aspects. How much um, automation 
have you affected and how has that changed over, how, how long have you installed ServiceNow? Uh, just a year now. Okay, so have you been able to implement a sort of serious IT automation initiative and uh, how far are you there? Uh, down uh, not as far as we'd like uh, and we, we have uh, plans for moving in, in that direction. So right now we, we developed a, uh, uh, a very user friendly and comprehensive service catalog on our website. So you can go to our website and you can see pretty much everything that IT offers. You know, all the different services we offer, who they're eligible for, how much they cost, how to get them. And it's regularly updated. And, and so it's a great first step forward and it's actually not a small feat to try to list and document all the services you have that you provide for your, to, your, to your clients. Uh, but what you can't do is then click a button and have it magically provision or magically order it, you know, in the sort of Amazon shopping cart experience that we all come to know and love. And so what we're, we're using ServiceNow is to provide that back-end workflow mechanism so that you can go to our website and say, yes, that sounds like a really interesting service. I want one of those and click it and it knows who you are and it sends off the request to the right people and it gets either automatically provisioned if it's an account or ordered if, it, if you want a cell phone or a laptop or something. Uh, and so ServiceNow is helping us to aut automate and uh, provide that kind of provisioning. So Rick, as you achieve that greater levels of automation, uh, will that change your metrics or will it just make them better? Well, I, I think as we implement those changes, what the metrics will do is to show us the progress that we've made mm. or not made, mm -hmm. but we believe that it'll really show us the progress that we've uh, made. It will uh, give us yeah. objective basis uh, to kind of track where we're going mm -hmm. and to show from where, from whence we've come. Yeah. I mean, it's early days for you guys, so I've been asking all the practitioners here um, what's, what, what they like ServiceNow to do better, what's on their to-do list, what could they do to make your life easier? I know you're kind of still <laughs> adopting the platform, mm -hmm. yeah. so maybe it's not an appropriate question for you, but I'll ask it anyway. Well, I think as with any uh, vendor partner, uh, what we always really like is visibility into what their roadmap is. So we always want to know, okay, what are you working on? What are your priorities? Do they match up with our priorities? Uh, I think all, all clients want input in what the uh, company's working on. And so they're telling us, okay, this is what's going to be in the Calgary release or in the Dublin release in the, in, in the future. And we want to be able to just raise a hand and say, you know that, that, actually, these things are more important to us than those things, or it'd be great if you worked on this feature over here, um, provide that kind of uh, uh, ongoing feedback. I think generally they're receptive, but I think that's, gonna, that's, that's an ongoing issue for us. Yeah, now, as far as, um, as, far as you know, cloud generally goes, you guys like totally on the cloud bandwagon, you're going hard after SaaS, after cloud infrastructure and, and the like, or are you more selective? Uh, I think where it makes sense, we're, we're very enthusiastic in certain areas. Obviously, uh, one of the big points, selling points for ServiceNow is that it is a cloud uh, application, so it's very nimble in that regard. Uh, we also have a, a significant Salesforce presence throughout the university, and it's probably growing. So in certain areas, we do have uh, 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 cloud adoption strategies. Uh, in other areas where it makes less sense, uh, we're not um, pursuing it as aggressively. On the whole, I think we're very uh, uh, cloud-friendly shop. Uh, but I think that's something which, you know, we look at it on, at, from a strategic point of view, which, where does it make sense to do that? Where does it make less sense? Excellent. All right, we have to break. So, uh, mm -hmm. Ricardo and, and Rick, thanks for coming on. Our and pleasure. also, Dorothy, yeah. earlier, really appreciate your perspectives. Good luck with, the, uh, with the initiative and the adoption. And, uh, and again, thanks for sharing your insights with our audience. All right, everybody, sure. keep it right there. We're right back. Beth White is in the house, and we're going to talk to her about knowledge, about ServiceNow's you know, marketing message. How do you make marketing a source of value for CIOs and IT practitioners? That's, that's a key topic that I want to talk to Beth about. So keep it right there, be right back after this word. Rock and roll. Well, I think it's probably five or six times I've been on theCUBE now. Right, and, you know, at first, the guys are just fun to work with. Pat, welcome back. Hey, always a pleasure to be in theCUBE. Hey, I'm about to go on theCUBE. You never know what's going to happen. I'm, uh, a three-time veteran of being on the Cube. Uh, I hope many, many more. Chad Sackets, Chad, welcome to the Cube. Dave, John, it's great to be here, man. I keep coming back because uh, great, insightful questions from uh, from uh, John and from Dave. What face-melting 
action have you seen here at the event? And I know there's a lot of it. It's a great vehicle to, uh, to communicate with a broad audience. A lot of folks watch. Great to have you back. Good job. All right, Craig Nunez, uh, VP of Marketing at HP Storage. Thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. When people mention theCUBE, they, they're like, oh my God, I saw you on theCUBE. And they're all excited about it. It's, it's, a, it's an experience. It's not just information. They experience kind of what's going on there. It's like real time. It's like they were there. That was like my going to the pleasure. gym. Boom, boom. Legendary IBMer, CEO of Symantec, and now CEO of Virtual Instrument. Uh, great to have you on theCUBE. So for CUBE to be here at a conference like this that's got 15,000, 20,000 people and sharing that live around